you know, when you look at the growth of electric vehicles and the numbers of electric vehicles, offshore wind is as significant because offshore wind, uh, although there aren't as many. Macro talk on rare earth here with Pat and Yuko. Pat, talking about the market here, I mean, rare earth very relevant for electric motors, for example, and we see the tipping point on acceleration EV sales here. We've had uh, 1 million EVs registered in the US alone in this year, so kind of a magic tipping point. What are your thoughts going forward uh, up to 2030 on the acceleration on one of the key markets for rare earth? And speaking to uh, EVs specifically, you know, the rare earth uh, component that, that helps an EV happen is in the motor. So the electric motor has the, you know, the, the rare earth oxide that is in a metal alloy form that turns into a permanent magnet that allows that, that vehicle to go that much further, meaning when you have a battery, now, you know, range anxiety is always something people look at, but without a motor that's very effectively running, the battery won't take you as far as it should anyway. From a tipping point, you know, if you look at the graph on the left, uh, 2025, we show a, a, an upward acceleration. And I think really the way to look at that, you know, there's a lot of talk in uh, North America right now about people readjusting their electrical vehicle build plans. And, and the reason for that is that, you know, when you have a new product, like an electric vehicle, on a demand curve, you have the early adapters. They're the ones that say, I absolutely need to have an electric vehicle. And so they jump in and they want that electric vehicle. And when the early adapters are, are done buying the product at a f fairly significant pace, then the early majority kicks in. And the early majority, they're, they're not so much the uh, the visionary and the have to have it like the early adapter is. They're the ones that say they're pragmatic. And, and by pragmatic, they want to make sure the price of the vehicle is right. They want to make sure the interest rate's not too high. They want to make sure the range anxiety works. They want to make sure there are charging infrastructures that work. And so some of that, that supply chain fortitude that allows an electric vehicle to really become affordable and, and make its way into the mainstream, by 2025, you'll, you'll start to see a lot of that kicking in. So companies here in North America, like General Motors and Ford, they've pushed their development plan out just a little bit because they're trying to get their supply chains in balance and make sure that they, number one, have materials to build the vehicles. They can build them effectively. It's not a loss on their balance sheet, but a, a, a gain and a profitability contribution. So by 2025, that's the point when things really turn and start to go in an upward trend. And, and by the end of the decade, by 2030, I know you're uh, you're showing a little bit further up, but by 2030, about a third of the global vehicles are destined to be electric. Certainly in China right now, that trend is very much uh, even greater than that because they have all the critical mineral inputs that allow it to happen. You know, with your chart on the right, very interesting. You, know, you look at the, the left of the bar chart, you know, those those first four elements, uh, you know, the uh, the lithium, the graphite, cobalt, nickel, those are all your battery inputs. And, and in an electric vehicle, there's a lot of those critical minerals that make the vehicle uh, battery. The rare earth side looks small and it talks about a three to seven times growth, but the reality is by the mid-2030, you're looking at about a $46 billion market per atomous intelligence. And without that rare earth element, without that small little bit of rare earth, the battery doesn't matter. You can have all the batteries you want, but if you don't have the rare earth to make the motor, then it, it doesn't matter. So very niche, very significant, small uh, portion of a market, but very necessary. And those that are pursue that and are our first mover in that market will certainly be winners. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, it is when we see in these markets that you start driving an EV yourself. Range anxiety, definitely something where sometimes I wish when I'm making a, a trip way up north uh, on a thousand kilometers, which is like 700 miles, that uh, yeah, if you're missing 20 kilometers to the next charger, you're missing 20 kilometers to the next charger. So you have to reduce your speed in order to still reach your destination. Now, luckily Tesla is smart enough to tell you uh, to reduce your speed but when you're going uh, slower than, uh, than even the trucks. Uh, the heavy goods vehicles, then you do wonder or you, you would wish that uh, you would have an additional range and looking at how Tesla improved their Model S, their Model 3 over the last uh, eight years, then the motor efficiency has been absolute key um, in addition to the aerodynamics and to the battery chemistry in creating more range and that's something that's needed next to uh, of course a lower price point uh, for mass market adoption and we'll see what happens if Tesla introduces the Model 2 in the next coming two years with a price point of around $25,000 which will lower the entry barrier and then hopefully kick off the next adoption rate, creating more demand for rare earth. Yeah, very, very well said. I mean, that, that's exactly how it works. Uh, you know, any new market that, that starts up, you know, if you've got in, in American dollars, the average electric vehicle price, uh, you know, just recently was $55,000 US with interest rates between six and 9%. The average consumer can't afford that. And, uh, and quite frankly, in Q3 of 2023, Ford Motor Company lost $1.3 billion on their electric vehicle market because they can't build them effectively yet. But it doesn't mean they're pulling back. It means they have to 
recalibrate their supply chains. They have to get their pricing down. And Tesla, you know, it's interesting you mentioned, so as, as people like GM and, and Ford and, and others sort of pull back a little bit to get their supply chains in order and their production uh, economies in order, Tesla will continue to make vehicles. They only have electric vehicles, so they'll, they'll continue to develop efficiencies and they'll continue to develop that consumer entry point price down. And, uh, and that will be good for the entire market, for the entire electric vehicle market. And I mean, we also see some of uh, the companies that have previously been struggling. So if we take Jaguar Motors, for example, they're currently more of a niche player um, and they want to move into the challenger position. And by going uh, into the, this kind of early adoption of all EV by 2025, they hope to kind of win an edge against the more classic competition that's currently occupying the market. And we've seen the same approach by Polestar uh, from the Volvo group they are also um, only a niche player wanted to be a challenger and went for all electric in order to get an edge now coming to the next infograph here on the size of the market you could argue well lithium graphite yeah it's uh, much bigger markets and also more increase in demand uh, up to 2040 but what this doesn't show is the amount of competition and who is market leader. And that's why I think UCOR scores very highly in the rare earth space. Yeah, very much. I mean, there, there are many people competing for that uh, significant battery space uh, revenue and whatnot. Uh, but on the rare earth side, uh, from a rare earth separation, which where UCOR is focused, there is very little, very, very little outside of China. When it comes to the metal alloy making, that needs to be developed outside of China. The magnet making needs to be uh, brought on in a mature way outside of China. Because quite frankly, the metal alloy uh, magnet making is 90% controlled by the Chinese market. That's why they're building so many EVs. That's why they're building wind uh, energy turbines the way they are. They've got a lot of offshore wind and onshore wind in China. And that's because they have all the critical inputs to be able to make that happen. So yeah, in the Western world, the, the technically challenging job of taking something like a rare earth uh, resource and there are a lot of there are a lot of developing rare earth resource projects, and and uh, you know it takes capital and it takes a lot of permitting to get those resources up and running. Uh, UCOR has identified or is in conversations with 14 different companies outside of China. With that, there are three or four that are, are very near to production, and they will be the first uh, inputs for the separation plant that uh, UCOR is building on the Gulf Coast. There are no other companies out there that really have an aggressive plan to take this smaller niche market and really take advantage of it and, and be able to uh, develop an economic model, develop a return for shareholders that is quite uh, quite significant in the in the long haul. I like that. That's kind of the Peter Thiel uh, style of growing your business. You start off with a niche, you try to dominate that, and then you grow further. Uh, what I also find interesting about rare earths, like you said, it's going to become a huge market, but still it's going to probably be highly specialized because all of those metals that we see on the chart, lithium, graphite, uh, they might become commoditized where uh, prices are set by a spot price. But with rare earths, you might be able to add a lot of value by having the right process, which potentially could increase the selling price which potentially, again, could increase the, the margins you as a company make. Is that correct, Pat, or am I on the wrong path? Yeah, no, no, you're, you're very much where you need to be with a business model. You know, the, um, a lot of people look at, um, you know, when you look at a bell curve of, of business and opportunity, a lot of the people look at the real meaty section on the bell curve. They go, I want that. I want the, that revenue. I want that big, chunky part of the bell curve. But the reality is that to the left of the bell curve, where you see the early opportunities, there's a lot more margin there. There's a, there are fewer players in that, that area. And that's where you need to be to really get your margin. Because the more you go for that meaty section of the bell curve, your margin goes down. Yeah, your volume might be up, but your your, your volume's up and your, your uh, profitability's down because it becomes commodity in nature and you want to remain away from that commodity side you want to get into the niche you want to stay where margins are higher and do the difficult jobs that others don't want to get done because uh, because they just don't want to and and that's where the business opportunity resides that's why UCOR is certainly focused there and uh, we've got another interesting graph here on European battery uh, production that is also accelerating and increasing and why is that relevant for UCOR more uh, battery production means uh, faster electrification, meaning more EVs, quicker, faster adoption rate, meaning there's more demand for electric motors at the end of the day. Yep, absolutely true. The uh, the more you see the battery increase, uh, the more the rare earth increases and the more that niche market increases. And, and again, I think a lot of uh, companies might miss the mark by not realizing in, in that niche area, there are fewer players. It, it's, a, uh, it's a technically difficult uh, job, but when you get it, get it done, the margins are significant. The return on the, the resource, you know, I always equate things to a gold resource. If you have a gold resource, 
you can probably sell that gold concentrate, you know, upwards for 95% of its value. If you have a rare earth concentrate, you'll sell it for probably 50% of its value because the real technical challenge of separating out the individual usable oxides is where there's a lot of margin gain there. That That's very much, you know, seems like a smaller market, but it's a very necessary market. That that battery market does not grow unless you have the rare earth oxides, the metals and the magnets to, to grow with it. And this also shows us two other things. One is that the capacity will actually outstrip uh, demand at some point going forward, meaning that obviously uh, prices are going to come down and it also shows the story of safe jurisdiction similar to UCO and North America that Europe is also seeking to cut off dependency from Asia. So hence a lot of government grants, government funding going into this whole industry, meaning more capacity, capacity maybe even growing quicker than demand which is bringing down prices, which will help the adaptation along the consumer curve that you earlier mentioned. Yeah, no, that's very true. You know, I was at a presentation in Toronto not that long ago. It was put on by Benchmark Minerals. And, um, you know, they talked about the growth curves of electric vehicles and, and where they're going. And the reality was when you equate that on a rare earth side to a shortfall, by 2030, you were actually 15 million electric vehicles short, meaning you didn't have enough material to build 15 million of those. And on an annual basis, you know, you've got about 85, 90 million total vehicles in the world so projections are that uh, a third of that or 30 million will be electric by the end of the decade but you've got a shortfall of 14 million where you don't have enough inputs to make that happen and so yeah government grants bringing more resources on board developing uh, uh, separation the way UCOR is which is key to allow the downstream with magnets to happen all that must work uh, together to be able to to feed that forward and you know in interesting our first separation plant in Louisiana which is a 7500 ton per annum plant of rare earth oxides, um, you know, the engineers look at that and they talk about the number of rare earth lines that are light, heavy, and all the process flow sheets. I look at the plant and I go, that's 3.8 million electric vehicles in that one plant. And so that's the kind of the macro view of what you're doing as you look at the market shift and trying to move forward and satisfy uh, the critical part of the supply chain that, that certainly UCOR is involved with. Yeah. And uh, we've got another graph here, um, a world's electricity supply. And that also shows that renewables are growing, that solar has actually hit a price point of around three, three and a half cents per kilowatt, subject to, of course, uh, the region that solar energy is being deployed. And that also will drive adoption because once people have solar at home, there is a bigger incentive to also have an electric vehicle. Because what happens in Germany, for example, is that if you sell your solar energy into the grid, you only get at nine euro cents. If you then at night take energy from the grid, you pay 40 or 35 euro cents. So that delta, people uh, would rather put that into their own vehicle and use their vehicle then for bi-directional, so loading and offloading, using their electric vehicle as a large storage unit uh, for their home energy consumption. So that's also going to drive EV adoption that people can uh, generate additional savings uh, in their household energy consumption. Yeah, no, very true. Uh, you know, the, uh, I remember seeing that concept with uh, Renault Nissan, uh, Nissan Renault Renpo a number of years ago, and they called it Smart City. And the way Smart City works is that your your vehicle is, in fact, exactly what you said. It's a it's a storage unit for power, and it comes back home, and if the power happens to go out in your, your neighborhood or whatever, the vehicle can actually power your home, and vice versa. And so, yeah, it's a really, uh, again, Smart City, a way to uh, look at 21st energy transition and make sure the, the grid is doing what the grid should be doing. And, and solar is a key part. You know, this, this time of year, it happens to be uh, on, in Canada here right now. It's, uh, it's December so the sun doesn't shine that much but there's certainly a lot of other renewable opportunity as well offshore wind is very significant and uh, same thing where you can power the grid and your your electric vehicle and your storage opportunities they all they all work together it's uh, it's a smart way to um, decarbonize our world it's a smart way to to bring the temperature of the world uh, down make sure we don't tip by that 1.5 degree uh, celsius and it's all very important that we work together on this that i think offshore wind is a very interesting topic actually to shortly talk about because if you need rare earths to uh, power electric car through its motors you probably also need rare earths in a, in a wind turbine to generate that power is that correct yeah very very true uh you know in a, um, a haliad x is a ge renewable wind turbine and haliad x actually uses um two tons of permanent magnets and uh, in a haliad x offshore wind turbine uh, it can actually power 16,000 homes. You know, from a rare earth oxide standpoint, there's about one ton of uh, rare earth oxide that goes into that particular uh, Haliad X uh, offshore wind turbine. So it's very, uh, very significant. You know, when you look at the growth of 
electric vehicles and the numbers of electric vehicles, offshore wind is as significant because offshore wind, uh, although there aren't as many, there's a heck of a lot more rare earth oxide and rare earth magnets being used in an offshore wind turbine than there is an electric vehicle. An electric vehicle might have two or three kilograms. An offshore wind turbine would have a ton. And, and Pat, um, can you disclose if any automotive companies have reached out to you right now in order to secure some of that rare earth processing that you're going to be, uh, some of that rare earth that you're going to be processing next year? Yeah, I, I can't use spe uh, specific names or under confidentiality, but uh, we have three that are very near at hand. One in particular, we're exchanging uh, red line agreements back and forth, uh, looking to get to a final offtake arrangement. Uh, in total, we've had five automotive companies in discussion, but we're not looking to just service automotive. We also have a uh, consumer electronics company that really likes the heavy rare earth that we're looking to process in Louisiana. And we also have uh, defense-based companies that are looking at us saying, we need what you have as well, because uh, you know, defense from, from drones to uh, uh, weapon guiding systems, it's all driven by rare earth and permanent magnets. So absolutely, in conversation with the end customer, you know, the uh, with your macro discussion here today, I. I tell our team all the time, it, it's great to talk about markets and, and how big the markets are, but at the end of the day, customers buy things, markets don't. So you've got to have customers that actually understand what they want so you can supply them exactly what they need in the time frame that you need to have it happen. And quite frankly, I've had a career doing that. I'm from the automotive industry and you know, I started a tier one automotive company back 25 years ago as a very young mechanical engineer and I understand how it works. And you've, you've got to have customers that know exactly what they want at different periods in time and reverse engineer your production plans to deliver for those customers. And not just one customer. We did have one customer say to us in the electric vehicle, we'll take everything you can supply. To which we said, no, we're not going to do that. Because just like you don't want to have one resource coming into your plant as a, uh, a supply feedstock, you want to have multiple choices to be able to geopolitically balanced and, and different things can happen. So you want to make sure you've got a good supply input. You also want to have a mix of customers that allow you to um, give a, a balanced approach to your uh, your business plan going forward. Pat, it's been an absolute pleasure and I look forward to our next macro talk in Q1 2024. Thank you very much.